U7 presents Introduction to Law Not the Status Quo Way, but the Cybernetics Way. Chapter 1 Law, Images of Order, and Chaos Life is a struggle against entropy or disorder. To fight entropy, we need information. Law creates order. Law is information. It is controlled information. It is also accumulated knowledge and hopefully collective wisdom. My introduction to law is based on cybernetics because cybernetics is the information expert. Hello, I am Javier Rivas. I am Mexican. I am an attorney. Mexico is a tough place. We do not pay much attention to being politically correct. Facts are much more important than historical grudges. Still, most Mexicans do not approve killing the soon to be born and even the worst narco-traffickers. Most of them respect family. I am currently concerned that the US Constitution, which has served as a model for many others, especially Latin American constitutions, is being under attack, is being tested, by angry protesters who also attack policemen. And as they do so, they are spreading chaos through many American cities. The law proves useless when authorities do not perform their sworn duties. The law's main power is not the power of coercion. It is the power of attraction. If the law is disregarded, entropy sets in and we are all in big trouble. And who is speaking out for the rule of law? I see the law community impervious to what is really happening outside the realm of the courts, what is happening to society. For three years, the opposition to the current government had bent every rule in the book against President Trump and failed. But the fueling of the hatred did not overflow until now. These images are the face of the 2020 political campaign for the White House. In the United States, politics just became lawless. No rules, everything goes. Local authorities disown the Constitution. The anti-lifers have lost all vestiges of shame. Chapter 2. A Commitment to Law I have to communicate very clearly, very directly, without regard for somebody being offended. As I speak, the world is suffering the coronavirus pandemic and the streets of major U.S. cities in the United States are in total chaos. Many people will agree that a big wave of change is inevitable. Fine, but what direction do we want to go? 
Some of us will turn to the Supreme Law of the Land for an answer. I have already defined law in another presentation that shows many of the traditional definitions. For now, I will just say, think of the world of law as a world which is parallel to the material world. Behind every human being, every chair and door, every building or road, every ship or plane, every school or business, there are thousands of laws, contracts, patents, rules, that populate the otherwise invisible world of law. Laws are information. They are immaterial. The law is a world of its own. Cybernetics is mainly about life and purpose, as in highly complex systems. Computers and artificial intelligence are part of cybernetics, not the main show. I think people will appreciate life more than they do now. The law is a highly complex system with zillions of possible interactions among the players. Saying this means something. Highly complex systems appear to have a life of their own. This is probably the most important fact of the whole presentation right up front. Human organizations are not living as a person, but in the eyes of a cybernetician, they are the same. Here is the way Stafford Beer explains it. He says, to cybernetic eyes, all viable organizations look exactly the same. They are underwritten by the same laws. Structurally speaking, as we shall see, a man and a business are exactly the same, and the whole of law is another viable structure in the form of the nation state. On the negative side, highly complex systems can generate goals of their own and become ultra stable. There are many examples. The current law system in the United States is clearly an ultra-stable system. It can resist almost anything you throw at it. The law system is the topic of our conversation. Not a cancer, but pretty much self-serving and impervious to what is happening to society. The triangle you just saw is a remnant of the way law was taught in England through the four ends of court, institutions from many, many centuries ago that were responsible for legal education. The benches, or governing bodies, exercise the exclusive right to admit anyone to practice law by a formal call to the bar. The four ends were located in the vicinity of the Royal Courts of Justice in London. My assurance to you, should you choose to continue watching, is that using the cybernetic approach to law, in about 90 minutes, you will get a better grasp about the law, its nature, how it works, the structures it creates, and its secrets, than in your first month or two at Yale, Stanford, or Harvard. Battling the status quo. For centuries, the law has been studied using the same methods, both in the civil Napoleonic tradition and the common law of the Anglo-Saxon countries. All over the world, legal systems are far behind in adapting the benefits of the information age to study the law. If you look in Google and type law is information, you don't get any results at all. During law school and later during my MBA studies, I began wondering what was the connection between law 
and systems thinking and cybernetics. After all, cybernetics was about control and communications. Obviously, there had to be some connection to the law. Then, luck intervened. I found Ashby's Introduction to Cybernetics in Spanish on a shelf in a bookstore, and a little later, Churchman book in my brother's home. Ross Ashby provided the linking pin between law and control through his Law of Requisite Variety. His book is Introduction to Cybernetics. You can get it free on the web. And C. West Churchman translated the complex philosophical thinking of Descartes, Leibniz, Locke, Kant, Hegel, and Singer, and others into the language of systems inputs, outputs, black boxes, etc. The book, The Design of Inquiring Systems. I worked on my book for several years, and then I was lucky enough to receive a Fulbright scholarship to visit the US, and I knew who I wanted to talk to. This was 1979. In that trip, I met John P. Van Gish, author of Applied General System Theory. He turned out to be Argentinian. We got along fine. I also met C. West Churchman and others. John kindly suggested that I read Platform for Change, a book by Stafford Beer. He would answer some of my questions regarding the practical application of Ashby's Law of Requisite Variety to Law. I wrote to Stafford and about two years later I met him in Toronto. I became hooked on management cybernetics for life. So now, I proceed to explain the subtitle of this video. When you enter law school, you are warned that you're going to learn a new, specialized language. Whether you are new to the law or a law professor does not matter. I know what law schools teach about the law, and there is a big, gigantic gap between law and cybernetics not just in the United States, but all over the Western world. Of course, this is the best way to keep strangers from meddling where they are not welcome. The next point is that the law, the legal profession, the schools and the courts act in concert like one big spider web. I say this well aware that the law system is not alone. Doctors and pharmaceuticals have their own system, as we have seen from the COVID-19 crisis. So do other professions. Even worse are the politicians, taught only by the bureaucrats like the Deep State, the United Nations, and other so-called institutions. Think of the Federal Reserve Bank, which is federal only in name. Here you have a clear example of the power of the perversion of language. Plato has a great allegory about prisoners in a cave. He illustrated that we are all prisoners of many caves we willingly walk into, as simply as we walk into a movie theater and accept a different universe or a different reality. The spider web has to do with a problem identified in management cybernetics known as pathological autopoiesis, imported by Stafford Beer from Umberto Maturana and Francisco Varela's discovery of how organisms maintain their structure and identity. In medicine, 
pathological autopoiesis is known as cancer. We are all guilty as charged. About the law as a spider web, I have four very short stories, but very illustrative. They will spell out the conundrum. At the Stanford Law School, I spoke to Professor Leninger about the possible contribution of cybernetics to law. He pointed to the fact that IBM had given Stanford $20 million grant to study the application of computers to the legal system. Actually, an attorney would not dare touch a computer at that time, and the Mac and PC were yet to be invented, although computers had very much sequestered cybernetics. When I visited the University of Wisconsin, I talked to a series of professors, among them Mark Galanter. He was much more upfront. He said something like this, Maybe cybernetics has all this potential you are talking about. I have no reason to doubt it. He said with a tone which meant he was rather fed up with my insistence. But it will never be used, he said, because the system is never going to change. Too many people make a good living from things not working as they should. Loyola University professor Robert Benson denounces the law spiderweb in his book The Interpretation Game. His sentence is irrevocable. Lawyers and judges have built a system of law that maximizes their profits. Lawyers protect themselves just as judges protect the interest of the bench also. Although their self-serving activities are not overt. First, in no way am I saying that the lawyers and attorneys do not feel the need for justice in this world. Our brains are hardwired for truth and justice, but that is another topic. An example of one such lawyer was Wallace R. Baker of Baker and McKenzie in Paris. He and I had correspondence. He had interest in finding another way to perceive the legal system, perhaps as a complex system. He said about my book, The Cybernetic State, my tentative conclusion is that your book has many interesting and useful ideas. I think you should probably address it to the general reading public, including public officials, lawyers, and politicians. Chapter 4. The Law Builds an Observer Or call it an inquiring system. If law is information, then it must be studied under the cybernetic paradigm. Not as part of Newtonian science, obviously, but not as a social science. And cybernetics as a very special way of dealing with observers, as you shall see. While Newtonian science divorces the observer from the experiment, as Galileo did, cybernetics is aware that the observer is actually choosing the system he is studying. To say this as an attorney would, Choose the system you want, but you have the burden of proof. Show how the variables identified are connected to each other. Here comes the first big challenge right off the bat. Cybernetics has a mechanical hard science aspect to it. Primitive control connections are mechanical it sort of overlaps with physics or engineering, but it was gestated from a statistical world. So 
we have other controls that are statistical and have now probabilistic causation. Then, cybernetics make an incursion into the invisible connections through communications. So we now have systemic, hard to trace causation, which really turns out to be circular causality. Very hard to pin down. Each one has its own scientific paradigm. One is traditional Newtonian science, the second is Einstein's relativity, and the third is the cybernetics paradigm. Cybernetics is large enough to envelop the other two. This became so because eventually second-order cybernetics had to intervene and start rebuilding how knowledge is produced by rethinking the role of the observer. The observer. Law creates an observer. Identifying a system is not always easy. The definition says, a system consists of a set of elements and relationships between them. That's pretty abstract. Now, law has the enormous job of trying to create a perfect observer of systems using imperfect human components, like judges, like attorneys. And then they have to follow detailed instructions to do that. That observer is the nation state who must preserve order, settle disputes, and do justice. Now, rebuilding the past out of noisy evidence and following a procedural manual to find out the truth is like trying to raise the law's observer to the level of an omniscient God who can see all and know all. To compound the problem, we know that the human observer is not objective at all. Different people carry different models or maps of reality. Call it a cultural bias or the effects of nurture. Maps, mental maps can be dominated by political ideology. And then some people just can't see what others see. The relevance of the observer to the systemic reform of the law is that activist judges have figured out that their role as gods may not be exactly true, but that with a creative ruling, they can change the social environment just enough to at least create new expectations among the public while their decision is revised or overruled months later. The law is systems blind, but also blind to the passage of time. Even though illegal or unfounded decisions get overturned and the guilty may be forced to indemnify their victim, or the president can stop illegal unvetted immigration, some harmful effects have already percolated into society. The law incorrectly assumes many things that are not true at all that an appeal returns things to the way they were and they should have always been is one of them, but it doesn't happen. In law, time is not relative nor reversible. Justice delayed is justice denied. Given that rebuilding history is even harder than predicting the future, legal procedures take enormous amount of resources it is very costly. Imagine turning a judge and a jury of 12 into a godlike machine is extremely difficult. Reasonable doubt or not, rules of evidence and their presentation takes hours and hours, more than the actual wrongdoing took. The result is a privatized, meaning negotiated, criminal justice system 
and a privatized civil justice system where about 95% of the cases do not reach a public trial and are settled. This in turn feeds the spider web and the spider web has a built-in need for society to become litigious. You have to see the circularity and positive meaning accelerated feedback loop that keeps this machine pumping money into the attorney's pockets. One would have to question the effect of pro bono litigation by huge law firms. What role does it play in keeping the money machine going? Please consider, as we shall see time and time again, that complex systems produce counterintuitive results. Chapter 5 The Law System About Purpose Norbert Wiener the founder of cybernetics, had been confronted with the problem of purposeful behavior just prior to and during World War II. Back then, scientists became aware that physics, in spite of all its glamour with Albert Einstein at the forefront, did not have a solution or a proper description of what was involved to produce life. As it turned out, cybernetics was a science that was able to explain purposeful behavior. In 1943, Arturo Rosenbluth, together with Norbert Wiener and Julian Bigelow, produced a paper, now quite famous, where they questioned the assumptions made by traditional science. Purpose, they assured, could be built into the system, into a mechanism. The key was to create a connection in the form of what we would now call an information loop where the output of the system is transferred back to the input and affected in such a way that the mechanism will display goal-getting properties. The name of the paper was Behavior purpose and teleology. Russell Acuff was an American architect that became an organization expert, philosopher and business and government consultant. He was the father of idealized planning, professor at Wharton, the University of Pennsylvania, pioneer in operations research, systems thinking and management science. He and Stafford Beer were very good, dear friends. First in line are systems where neither the parts nor the whole have a purpose. For instance, a clock mechanism. Second, where the system as a whole has a purpose, but the parts do not. For instance, a human being. The third type of system is where the parts and the whole have purposes, such as the case of social systems, business organizations, and the nation state. The fourth type of system is one where the whole does not have a purpose, but the parts do. For instance, the ecology. Russell Acuff had it figured out. Then comes his friend Stafford Beer and says, wait a minute, you cannot apply causation or free will causation in a complex system. That is what makes it complex. To ascribe purpose, you can only look at the results. So. The purpose of a system is what the system does. This changes a lot of things for aspiring lawyers and law professors because the ecology does not have a will in the human sense, but it does have a purpose. It keeps us alive. 
according to Meir, that is its purpose. The same can be said for the whole universe. A more trivial example, dogs do not know that their purpose is to keep their owners happy or busy or cleaning after them. If a Martian comes to Earth, he would say that 90 million dogs and about 95 million cats rule the United States without speaking a word. We now know that systems prevail over individuals. That is just a fact of life. Here's an example I am familiar with. A countryman of mine that litters the streets, does not use a seatbelt, and will offer a bribe to get away without a ticket, will become a perfect citizen once he crosses the border into Texas. Systems are gigantic attractors. They prevail over people. Systems become attractors. As they grow stronger, they are able to absorb more and more reinforcements. The law is a huge attractor. Think of a vortex, like a galaxy, where a black hole in the center is pulling in more and more stars into its spiraling motion. This attraction is what characterizes a legal system, the support it receives by people that are attracted to follow its rules, not the coercive side of legal norms. This attraction phenomena also explains why people see conspiracies where none exist. It is the effect of a positive feedback loop. No conspiracy is necessary to explain what is going on. As attractors grow, they generate and display more emergent unforeseen features. An example, the PRI party in Mexico outlasted the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Now, you want to know about a bigger people attractor? There is another huge attractor, the USA. And it was the PRI that produced that orange spike. In spite of the overwhelming conspicuous presence of huge complex systems, system blindness still prevails. I asked several Yale students studying for a master's degree in economics. If the economy were an animal, actually an organization, could you tell me its name? They could not. So I asked the same question to you. If the legal system is an organization, what is the name of this animal? In both cases, the answer is the same. The nation state is the economy and the law its DNA. The cybernetic approach, why this, not that, not something else? Taking a cybernetic approach to a problem begins by asking, what are all the possibilities in this case? Then you look at the constraints that tame down the possibilities. You get closer to pinning down the relevant variables or cofactors that co-produce the result. That is the cybernetic approach. Very closely linked to information theory. The universe of possibilities in law can be explained using Venn diagrams, which is set theory. Venn diagrams are very useful to explain liberty as a context for duty and other obligations. In the universe of possibilities, liberty is constrained in two ways. Things you cannot do, 
prohibitions, things you must do, duties and obligations. The rest is up to you. In contracts, you exchange a promise with another person, and there are three choices, to do, to abstain, or to give. The law may force you to fulfill your contractual obligations. Now compare the system of liberty against a totalitarian regime. The typical notion of a legal norm takes the form of a syllogism with an hypothesis followed by a consequence followed by a sanction in case the consequence is disobeyed. If you do this, for instance, drive, then you must also do this other thing, get a license. If you do not perform, then your sanction is a fine, for instance. As you can tell, ethical and moral norms do not have a publicly sanctioned enforcement as a legal norm does. When you study natural law, and refer it to natural rights, think of the cybernetic laws of viability and it will all make sense. There is no natural law for death. Death is the absence of life, the collapse of viability. It is thermodynamic chaos and falling into the entropy pit. The missing language, breaking away from Newtonian causality. Law schools are famous for having their own libraries. Lawyers are known to have their own special language. Cybernetics can tackle many of the problems faced by the law. But in order to do so, you must learn a new language. The use of certain words and certain metaphors reveal the Newtonian paradigm in use. We talk of the powers of the state, their balance and separation. Decisions are a force. Ideas gather momentum. We speak about a judicial machinery or Moscow's satellite states or friction among members. The law belongs to the cybernetic paradigm. This is why the Founding Fathers did so well in shaping the U.S. Constitution as they did. It is full of self-organization, systems, borders, homesteads, filters, amplifiers, and other cybernetic tools. We will go to that now. We start with information. Information is information, said Norrediner, not matter or energy. Law is information. It is conveyed as messages, instructions, procedures, graphics, or structures. Jurists have called law a normative order. Correct. Order is another name for information. The U.S. Constitution is not a parchment or a small book, nor a CD, USB, or some other file in the cloud. A legal norm is different from an ethical or moral norm in many ways. Its source, its access to coercion, its exteriority, but all norms belong to the realm of information. Russell Acuff had information figured out. He begins with data and starts building. Data, he says, are facts you collect. Then information is a description. It tells you what. Then there is knowledge, instructions on how to do something. Then there's understanding, the explanation, answering the why question. 
Then there is wisdom. What is best? A vision. Data plus context equals information. Information plus rules equals knowledge. People bring context and meaning to create information. Data is processed and organized into information. But information in the most general term includes facts, data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. Hopefully, our laws are wise or are based on knowledge. What is certain is that we cannot build good laws without good information based on trustworthy data. Information is what you need to manage a very complex system. So what is a complex system? Well, a complex system, we talk about them because the number of parts and their internal relationships make their potential behaviors impossible to enumerate. That's why we talk about very complex systems. So we are left with the need to model a complex system and keeping the features relevant to us in the model that fit some purpose of ours. If you say you see a system, you have the burden of proof. You must show how its variables are linked. Science is about making models. This phrase belongs to John von Neumann, one of the greatest geniuses that ever lived. He is the co-inventor of the modern electronic computer, among many other accomplishments. Lately, this man by the name of Dave Snowden has made an important contribution to understanding systems and complexity, and how complex is very different from complicated and simple, not to mention chaotic. The key point here is that highly complex systems, seen on the top left, are inescrutable. We can only model them work with the model and learn something, then revise the model. This is the way, by the way, that legislation works. It goes round and round. Procedural law and electoral laws, for instance, are complicated systems, not complex systems. Each quadrant here seen here has a different approach, a different discovery, and uses different methods. Information is needed for control, and in control, we have the law of requisite variety, which I find has an amazing relationship with a very well-known definition of justice. It says, Justitia es constant et perpetua voluntas ius sum quique tribuendi. It says, Translating, justice is the constant and perpetual will of the law to give to each his own. This definition of justice by Roman jurist Domicio Ulpiano in the third century is probably the most well known. Amazingly, this definition is another way to express Ashby's law of requisite variety that says only variety of source variety, to each his own. Variety is a measure of complexity, of the complexity of a system, or the number of possible states that a system can acquire. Now, let me translate the law of requisite variety. It says that the regulation of a system requires that the regulator exhibit the same variety as the variety produced by the system. The graphic on the right shows Ashby's law as an information flow that must be balanced. No balance, no regulation. No balance, no justitia.
you might have noticed that the variety of the regulator is much smaller than the variety of the system. Well, that explains the presence of filters and amplifiers. Now, what do you see here? The same law in two steps. This is the basic three element structure of Stafford Beer's viable system model. A system or operation with its management and its relevant environment. Now here is a good surprise. It is also the description of the three elements of the nation state. Louis the 14th Emperor of France would disagree. He is the guy that said, L'état c'est moi. I am the state. Requisite variety. A code to cope with it. Here's a short story. When Napoleon ordered the whole French civil law to be codified into one written code, the rationale was that with such a precise instrument, people would not need lawyers. Well, the ink of the Napoleonic civil code had not yet dried when different schools of interpretation were being born. The code helped some, but attorneys survived. Napoleonic law versus case law. The civil law is made by the judge following principles derived from Roman law incorporated into an extensive code. This is a logical structure, hierarchical. Common law or case law is built up from judicial decisions applied in previous cases or precedents. This is mainly based on experience. These two systems have a very different variety strategy. One is top down and the other one is down up. The law or regulator, as we saw previously in the law of requisite variety, must match the immense variety generated by the population and it needs a structure. Now, Napoleonic systems of law create a logical structure going from principles to specific cases, from the general to the particular. Common law solves cases and then tries to infer the principles. It goes from the particular to the general. Quite different strategies. In both systems, attorneys are rewarded when they are able to create a new rule. Now, let's turn our attention to another cybernetic control amplifier found in nature, the recursion principle. Nature is an optimizer. Now, given that nature is an optimizer, it does not like waste. Once it found how to regulate life in a cell, the recursion principle kicked in. You can call it nature's own copy-paste regulation strategy. All life on the planet has the same structure. Once you have a cell, you go to tissues, organs, organ systems, and the human body all of them applying the same principle at different organization levels or recursions. The law of viability says every viable system contains viable systems and is contained in another viable system. Lawyers and legislators discovered this recursion principle long ago. In fact, we live in a fractal universe, as above, so below. 
The U.S. has a federal level, a state level, and within the states there are counties and cities. Inside of each, the same basic structure repeats itself again and again. An assembly or collective brain of sorts, an executive, a judiciary, a territory, and a border. Amazingly, the body of Christ, the church, is also a recursive structure. For more information, please go to YouTube, Management Lessons of the Bible. The human brain and nervous system are the most perfect regulatory system in the universe, and it is self-organizing. On the right is Stafford Beer's description of its most basic structure. Stafford Beer's viable system model is the most perfect application of Ashby's law and the mapping of the human nervous system. The Universal Governance and Management System 7 model is my version of the viable system and it is a more user-friendly portrayal of the VSM. The U7, for short, has seven systemic functions and it means that all these functions meet the necessary and sufficient conditions to create a viable system. These are also recursive, found at every level of the organization and can be used as management criteria for effectiveness in any managed business process or government process. These are identity, planning, execution or direction, coordination, operations, security, and error detection channel or audit channel. The modern democratic nation state has all the elements of a cybernetic state, meaning its design matches the VSM and UMS7 model. This happened with a little help from the Iroquois. If you recognize this as the structure of the United States of America, it is because this design is exactly the one prescribed by the U.S. Constitution. We the people is the identity with its values and norms. It all drains downwards towards the Congress and the executive. The courts handle conflicts at many recursion levels, including disputed laws or the constitutionality of a law, which is a local path to the U.S. Supreme Court. When we are more interested in behavior than structure, we appeal to the black box invented in electrical engineering. Sometimes it is practical to turn a system, a complex system, into a black box. This happens when you are interested only in the input-output relation, not in the structure that transforms the input into something else. The black box came, as I said, from electrical engineering and was adopted by the Macy founders of cybernetics. Now we turn to the idea of feedback, which is a key cybernetic idea. Here is a black box approach to explain information feedback, creating a circular causality loop. The presence of circular loops are the distinctive feature of highly complex systems such as the nation state or the whole of the law system. 
you have a system producing an output against a desired result. There's a comparator and the difference is fed back as information to alter the input, closing the loop. This is the technical meaning of feedback. Stafford Beer is shown here explaining the main characteristic of technical feedback as control that is built into the system. To get a bad grade in a test is not technical feedback, it's perhaps personal feedback. The important thing to realize about systems is how they are controlled. And we must get rid of any notion straight away that control is something imposed on the system from outside. It has to be built into it. Now you saw me uh, operate this governor just now and noticed how the engine slowed down. Let's see how the mechanism works. Suppose the engine is racing, then the governor flies open like that. You see it lifting here, transmitting the message along here, lifting that cam up here and then shutting off a valve there. That is built into the system. It's called feedback and feedback is ubiquitous in control systems. The law system is ultra stable. It means that it will maintain its stability in spite of the shocks it receives that were not contemplated in its design. On the right is a homeostat design by Ross Ashby. Ultrastability is like a synergy effect, an emergent property. The law system is ultra-stable because there are many people and forces that will act quite spontaneously in manners that preserve the system. The law of requisite variety applies to every connection among the seven systemic functions of the U7 model including the inputs and outputs and among the different operations. Amplifiers and filters in cybernetics. This is what the laws are all about. Meeting requisite variety to get control is what the law wants. To do so, it must amplify its control or filter out some of the system's variety. We as citizens have our place in the environment and as operators. Some get elected or appointed to become part of the government. However, as citizens, we the people are the government of the government. Especially in legal procedures, the law follows Boolean algebra with its operators, whether lawmakers know about it or not. Very lineal thinking. The law loves binary choices as it builds instructions on how to proceed. If a certain condition is met, the answer is yes, do this. If the answer is no, do something else. Law is Social Software. This book by two professors from Duquesne University gives proof that legal procedures discovered the use of Boolean logic before computers. The book breaks down the law into flowcharts where a process becomes a series of binary yes or no decisions, much in the way computers are programmed one step at a time. Borrowing from the Macy Group, Ideas on Cybernetics, Carl Deutsch applied system thinking to the political system and explained it in terms of black boxes, inputs, and outputs. His model shows the circular nature of legislation. Once it is tested in real life, citizens eventually get to opine and vote on new reforms. 
on the left support and demands are the input to the system and in the output are decisions and legislation or policies that then have their effect on the public and are fed back their reactions to create a new input. This is the circular nature of legislation. Chapter 7 Law Its Natural Structure This is an approximate classification of law, both in the civil tradition and in the common law tradition. You can see it is split into substantive law, the rights and obligations, and procedural law. On the other hand, it gets divided into public, private, or sometimes social. Here, we are not that much interested in this classification. We want the real structure, what makes it work. This graph by no means reflects the historical process by which the law evolved. For instance, the civil code came before the constitution. And yet this constitution is supposed to be the supreme law of the land. So how does that work? We start the description of the seven systemic functions with identity, with the members, purpose, values, goals, and normative planning. At the constitutional level, we the people are the identity, as is a more perfect union, the purpose. At the corporate level, the stockholders assembly and the purpose could be build computers. At the small business, you have the owner and he wants to generate income. Identity has been characterized by mission and vision statements. Planning, or we can call it intelligence gathering takes care of the outside and then. The main role is exploration, learning, which is adjusting behavior to past experiences, and adaptation, which is adjusting structure. Recursion zero, we have the Constitutional Congress and amendments. At recursion one, we have the US Congress. In business, call it marketing, research, or planning in general. At the personal level, education is your planning, what you do to change the future. Execution or direction is about the here and now. At the recursion zero, it includes the three powers of government. At the recursion one, in government, you're talking about the executive power or the president. In business, it could be the executive committee. Also the director, the synergizer, or the boss. Also the head of the vertical authority channel. The coordination systemic function is a very important one, because it handles agendas, programming schedules, rule books, and everything needed to prevent systemic oscillations, much like an internal cop. Coordination prevents interoperational conflicts that free the executive function from many interventions. A most vital role of coordination in respect to the law is the creation of contracts. A contract is a formal exchange of information regarding future behavior of the parties involved. In the U7 model, parties are 
the viable systems inside the operation or business context they are in. Every day, millions of contracts are celebrated following, in most cases, predetermined templates as to ensure that there is no confusion that will invalidate the contract because of a misunderstanding. Coordination appears also in the creation of shared standards. Standardization continues to be a useful variety reduction strategy. However, if properly used, computers are excellent variety amplifiers and can control robots and sophisticated production lines to give every customer exactly what he or she wants. Total quality control and total quality management depend on mastering the systemic coordination function. In the information age, the legal world saw the arrival of businesses that provide a setting for individual contracts to take place through online connections. This is the case, for instance, of Amazon and eBay. eBay is especially interesting because it is the public itself that applies social control to ensure the honesty of the merchants. Fernando Flores developed Conversations for Action, a workflow for ensuring the proper exchanges of information in contractual situations. He is also known for having drafted Stafford Beer to create the Cypressin project in Chile in the years 1971 to 1973. Operations are the doors. If planning is exploration, operations are exploitation. One has a circular causality logic, the other a cause-effect logic. Operations materialize the declared purpose of the viable system. They are the value and income generators and could potentially be siphoned off into a viable system on their own. Operations are the targets of mergers and acquisitions with the managements frequently blown away. The error detection channel is also the audit channel in some cases or the anomalies reporting channel. It is certainly a systemic function. You can call it the justice channel, an important vertical channel going up to report all types of claims, errors, and anomalies. In the nation state, it's the administration of justice. At a corporation level, the audit department or the complaint box, if you want. Claims later go to a trial and the sentence enforced through the vertical authority central channel. New computer and communications technology allow this channel to go and grow to unsuspected dimensions. Security is a function that I added to the viable system model and I broke it up into smart, strong and safe. Smart seems to fit the meta system where intelligence plays the most important role. Strong applies to the operations. We want strong companies, strong factories, strong people, not vagrants. And we want a safe environment never respect. Because of the COVID-19, we have not yet figured out how new necessary safety measures will impinge on personal liberties and personal information. We all want a safe environment. Humans are changing the environment in ways which are not safe but also not predictable. 
However, because of our respect for the complexity of highly complex systems, we cannot trust computer modeling of the environment. At this point, we must listen to our human intuition. Chapter 8 Laws, Complex Systems, Problems I have said in previous chapters that highly complex systems develop a will or a purpose of their own. So, how do they get in trouble? Or how do they get us in trouble? The law is a self-organizing system in the sense that nobody can plan it from beginning to end. It's always adapting. It's always changing. So we have to find ways to make it work for us. Peter Senji is well known for his book on the fifth discipline, which is precisely systems thinking. The archetypes are typical problematic systems that appear everywhere. Remember, systems emerge they can be self-organized, especially in the absence of rules. Senji has given each one of them a very distinctive name. This graph is about the system of systems archetypes. The whole show. Basically, it says that cybernetics gives you two choices. To grow or to fix a problem. Growth is about positive feedback, accelerated, that never lasts forever. Nature won't allow it. Think about the 2008 banking crisis. Now, fixing problems is about balance or negative error correcting feedback. So you have two symbols, R, accelerated, and B, balancing. The archetypes emerge from different ways in which growth leads to the need of balancing <clears throat> or balancing leads to more balancing. Here is the list of the system's archetypes. Cycle of accelerated feedback, escalation, accidental adversaries, my growth leads to your decline, limits to success, tragedy of the commons, growth and underinvestment, drifting goals, balancing loop, fixes that backfire, and shifting the burden. What does this have to do with law? Well, I think that lawyers must have two abilities. You have to know how to make a large problem small and you have to know how to make a small problem large. So why is this list important? Here are some mappings, really fast though. All these archetypes in red are litigation or negotiation opportunities. Complex systems have a knack for creating interesting paradoxes. I won't go into details, but the Hammurabi Code shows that almost 4,000 years ago, the rulers knew about using paradox to keep people honest. The Code of Hammurabi which dates back to 1754 B BC, has used the paradox to create smart laws. Here's law number three. If a man has borne false witness in a trial or has not established the statement that he has made, if that case be a capital trial, that man shall be put to death. This is like disarming the arms race. Complex systems have a knack 
for creating interesting paradoxes. I won't go into details, but the Hammurabi Code shows that almost 4,000 years ago, the rulers knew about using paradox to keep people honest. The Code of Hammurabi, which dates back to 1754 BC, has used paradox to create smart laws. Here's law number three. If a man has borne false witness in a trial or has not established this statement that he has made, if that case be a capital trial, that man shall be put to death. This is like disarming the arms race. Both law and economics got into a lot of trouble when they adopted reductionist methods to solve problems that belong to the complex system domain. So, the law and economics movement, or theory, looks more like a behavioral study than a legal or economic study. It is a theory of jurisprudence that seeks to explain the behavior of legislators, prosecutors, judges, and bureaucrats using positive economic analysis methods. I must insist that law and economics are different descriptions of the behavior of the same organization, the nation state, and all its component parts. The Prisoner's Dilemma is a good exercise in game theory, very well known now at a popular level. The different payoffs establish incentives to confess or not to confess. Maybe you've heard about the Monty Hall problem. It helps us settle the police variety being unappreciated. See, police work is very challenging. Cybernetically, it is a high variety work. Policemen face many different situations. While one situation requires firm politeness, another may require brash violence. The law is usually blind to probabilities, neither legislators nor judges understand policemen. I bet they would fail the Monty Hall problem. In the Monty Hall game, you are facing three choices, three doors, and one of them has a car. After you make a choice, you are shown one of the doors with a goat. So you know the car is in one of the other two doors. Would you change doors after the door with the goat appeared? My point is that the law keeps ignoring probabilities and demanding that police present more and more proof of probable cause before a raid of a crack house is authorized. As probable cause gets more difficult to obtain, criminals are incentivized to operate a crack house worry-free for a longer time. The end result of this system, if you look at the whole picture, is paradoxical. The disadvantage that are aimed to be protected by the procedures are suckered by stupid rules to provide drugs to many others just as disadvantage creating the classical positive feedback loop. Gun rights and the Second Amendment provide a very clear case for cybernetics shows that gun rights are not a threat, but actually a high gain amplifier for law and order. I have already produced a lengthy video explaining why this is so. Again, cybernetic thinking goes against intuitive thinking 
in many cases. However, using the requisite variety equation, it is easily demonstrable that society is better off with the Second Amendment in place than without it. People in the U.S. have very little idea of just how powerful criminals get when the population at large is unarmed. You cannot argue against what is evident from the law of requisite variety. Complex system cases are prone to have counterintuitive solutions. Young people should be taught the law of requisite variety so that they can learn to think correctly in a high variety complex case. Manipulating young minds helps no one. You want to dispute requisite variety? Good luck! Abortion, another counterintuitive solution. It is quite simple. Abortion allows women to ignore taking precautions to avoid pregnancy. Ideal planning is ignored. Societies should punish men who impregnate women and refuse to take responsibility for the child. It does women no good to distort language and switch from freedom to abort to freedom to choose. As in the crack house case, the traditional solution is typical system blindness. Chapter 9. The Law and Politics Vortex Several days before the 2016 election in the United States, in speaking before the United States and Mexico Bar Association, I predicted that Donald Trump would win the election. I had an advantage. I had lived through two previous experiences that were very much alike to the situation that Trump was facing. Also, I knew that cybernetic systems and chaotic systems are full of paradox and surprises. The Trump election was just another example. The more the press criticized Trump, the higher his credibility as an agent of change. The personal attacks actually help him win. Then I made a video, Why Trump, Why Now, in YouTube. Here is another of the most powerful reasons why he won, keeping the Supreme Court conservative. Had Hillary Clinton won, Americans would say goodbye to the Second Amendment and perhaps a little later to religious freedoms. Without that balance, the structural safeguards of the Constitution would be easily torn down, giving space to an authoritarian, bureaucratic kleptocracy. And in that situation, the activist justices would be fine with everything. A virtual Congress would be a big step towards the cybernetic state. Every constitution has its assumptions. Now, the U.S. Constitution is about 240 years old. It was designed when communications equals transportation. So communications were not faster than a horse. Today, in matters of exchanging information, distance, is not a factor. It doesn't exist. The COVID-19 crisis has created the first Congressional Committee virtual forum. This is the future. I wrote about an Obamagate surfacing in El Norte newspaper of Monterrey in February 9th, 2018. It did not take too much political insight to realize 
that an Obama gate was underway. At first, to prevent Trump from winning, and later, to remove him from office. Big, heavy systems leave big footprints. Obamagate is obvious. The Obamagate began way back with the Benghazi cover-up. The modus operandi is the same in every attempt. They accuse Trump of the things they did. Here is a map of the plot, those instigating it in the blue section, and those against it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Prior to 2016 and 2017, the worst known instance of abuse of power by an administration was Richard Nixon's abuse of his administration to target his political enemies. By any measure, what the Obama-Biden administration did in 2016 and 2017 makes everything Richard Nixon even contemplated pale in comparison. And Richard Nixon rightfully faced impeachment and ultimately resigned as a consequence of his misconduct. The evidence that has been made public has made clear that the Obama administration targeted his political opponents, targeted President Trump and his campaign, unleashed, weaponized, and politicized the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the intelligence community, and that the decision-making to do so went right up to the very top. We know that on January... It wasn't the Russians who withheld information from the court about General Flynn that they were setting him up and out to get him. It was the Department of Justice, it was the FBI, it was people who hated Trump. The people had a political bias, an agenda to destroy him before he was elected and after he was elected. And we're going to get to the bottom of it. Chapter 10 the law system for business and finance. The law calls corporations legal persons. Is that correct? From a cybernetic viewpoint, there's a commonality in the structures, in the control structures. So they are very much alike. Corporations have been an enormous invention they are one of the most important inventions ever in human development. And cybernetics can tell us exactly why a legal person and an individual have the same structure. I have talked about the UMS7 and startups. The partners in a startup immediately have to think about security, protecting their secret formula, their exclusive process, their winning marketing strategy, or their incredible new gadget. Then they can proceed with the planning. The UMS-7 works as a canvas project too. Corporate Governance Public corporations are cybernetic entities. Some corporations evolve from an owner-manager scheme to a huge public corporation. According to Professor Lynn A. Stout, the public corporation registered in Wall Street is a legal person, but not a fiction at all. It is indistinguishable from a living being. She's got her cybernetics correct. On the right, a graph with the explanation by Professor William Pounds. For anyone with the medium knowledge of the dangers posed by positive feedback loops, the 2008 financial crisis was absolutely predictable. Yet, Alan Greenspan, chair of the Federal Reserve of the United States, testified that the collapse came because of a flaw in his view of the world markets. His exact words were these. He said, 
I was shocked because it had been going for 40 years or more with very considerable evidence that it was working exceptionally well. Apparently not so well. Too many people suffer because of system blindness. It is inexcusable at the highest levels of government. The post-COVID-19 generation must put an end to it. Attorneys are considered agents of the court by the procedural codes. Bringing cybernetics to law is not going to diminish the amount of work being done by lawyers or attorneys. It will, however, increase the efficiency of the legal process. In society, variety is infinite. Technology will continue to have a big impact on the law. Pictures inside your brain are no good at lying. The brain cannot fool itself. Brain activity scanning technologies can say whether you have seen this woman or not, whether you touch this person inappropriately or not. A heartbeat from your eye watch could probably contribute to testify against you. So, how far? How soon? In one of his last papers, Stafford Beer created the idea of the culpabliss error in reference to the careless indifference of people with power and responsibility when they ignore the existence of complex systems. Many misfortunes can be prevented with the dissemination of systems knowledge in schools and universities. Ours is a different world and it gets tougher by the day. We should at least give ourselves a chance to fare better, much better. Finally, I can say that cybernetics continues the job of interconnecting different scientific disciplines. Cybernetics is everywhere. It's like air, said MIT Sandy Pentland. And I say beware that cybernetic laws are hard science, but have nothing to do with physics. Now, if you look at observers and relativity, they are the matter of second order cybernetics. my library, my books, and also dozens of videos on YouTube. Here is a photograph with some of my favorite books on cybernetics and management cybernetics. Here are my books. The titles in blue are available in Apple iBooks. Thank you. Thanks again for watching.